go ahead and get started. I know I just came from work. Uh, that may be a, something that some of you maybe wish you had work to go to, and some of you may wish, yeah, I know what you're talking about, and you, I just came from work too, and I'm drained, I'm whooped, I'm whatever. Um, but we all probably have different opinions or feelings about work. Um, but it was kind of a, a busy day at work, so now it's our time here uh, to just kind of chill and relax and take a deep breath uh, and hopefully um, learn something from the Word. We're going to be, again, if you have your Bibles with you, um, uh, finishing up Acts chapter 1. So we're going to be in Acts 1, uh, picking up basically from verse 8 through the end of the chapter, verse 26. So a little intro. Uh, I didn't do this last week, so hello, my name is Tom Truxton. I'm an elder here at the church. I have been an elder here uh, for a little over a decade now. So uh, one of the first ones to be inducted as an elder here at the bridge by Pastor David. Uh, announcements. We have a work day coming up this Saturday. Uh, this Saturday's work day is going to be a big work day. It's going to get kicked off at about 7.30 in the morning, but you don't have to show up right then to come and enjoy and partake. So just show up sometime in the morning if you're able to. There's going to be a, a long list of things to do, I'm sure. Um, and it'll at least go through noon um, so, and maybe even longer and into the afternoon. And then we have School of Discipleship. You may hear that phrase called SOD. Um, SOD is School of Discipleship. Uh, it's something that we offer in the spring and in the fall, so twice a year. It's a 10-week class. I'd encourage you uh, to sign up for that if you haven't already. Uh, we really encourage our staff and our leadership, uh, deacons and elders and so forth, um, life group leaders and so on, to, to engage in School of Discipleship. It just helps you uh, mature as a Christian and, and deepen your walk with Christ. Then there's going to be three different uh, financial classes that are going to be offered here starting in April. So depending on, don't, it doesn't matter where you are in your financial situation, but there's going to be three classes. One of them is called FPU, abbreviation for Financial Peace University. Um, so we've had that here now for several years also. That's also offered in the spring and in the fall. That's going to start on, a, it's going to be on a Sunday, April 3rd. Another financial class is Smart Money, Smart Kids. It's going to be on a Saturday, April 2nd. That's going to be not for kids, but it's for the parents to help raise up their children uh, with good biblical financial stewardship type teachings. And, so, and that's a six-week class. So that's not a real long class. And then finally, the Legacy Journey is a seven-week class, also going to be on a Sunday evening here. Um, so a lot of things coming, on, coming up. Uh, the Legacy Journey class, you could probably call that like an FPU 2, you know, the kind of the second class after FPU, but you don't have to take FPU before you take Legacy Journey. Um, Legacy Journey is going to be more uh, for those people that may be further down the road with their financial situation as far as, you know, their wealth building may be a little bit further down the road. They don't have as much debt, and they've, uh, maybe they've got the couple kids in college or already through college. Uh, maybe they're fully funding their retirement, and they want to start thinking about leaving a legacy to their kids and their grandkids. So that's what the Legacy Journey is all about. So those are three different uh, levels, three different classes that we're going to be offering here coming up in April. You've already heard Pastor David mention those as well uh, from the stage on Sunday. <coughs> All right, so with that said, any questions about announcements? Okay, well, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today and for this opportunity once again to uh, go through your word. Lord, last week we began in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to finish chapter 1 tonight. And Lord, I just pray that there will be um, uh, a great infilling of us even, of the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we think about your word, as we talk about your word, Lord, that the men in this room right here and now, Lord, they uh, may become moved to be more diligent, to be in your word, to study. There's going to be a lot of information that I share with uh, this group tonight, and it's good to, to be a, a Berean being in the Word and studying the Word. And um, I'm going to share an example where through doing the study, I was able to correct something that I had in my Bible that was wrong. Um, it was a note that I made, <laughs> so it wasn't part of the Scripture. Uh, so, I mean, and that's a good thing to be able to uh, continue to learn and uh, be able to um, build upon the knowledge that we may already have or just to deepen the knowledge that we have. And Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity once again to go through your word and hopefully maybe even share it with others as we leave here uh, during the course of the, the days and weeks to come. So we thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? 
Amen. All right, so just a brief overview of, I'm not going to backtrack and cover verses 1 through 8. We already did that. So just for some of you that weren't here uh, last week, uh, but, but who wasn't here last week, just so I know. Uh, so three or four, five people, okay? I'm just going to mention, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, you know, those are a couple things that kind of help us wrap our mind around uh, a situation or a new topic. So who is the who when we're talking about the book of Acts? Well, Luke, a Gentile doctor, wrote the book of Acts to show the fulfillment of Jesus' words. Even though the author of the book of Luke and Acts does not really come out and name himself, it, neither one of them come out and say, Luke, I wrote this book. Um, it is pretty much accepted that this non-Jewish person, Luke, uh, is the author of the book of Luke in the Gospels and this book of Acts. So that's the who. What about the what? The book of Acts provides a condensed history of the early church, an eyewitness account of the spread of the gospel all the way from Jerusalem westward towards Rome. Uh, the recurring theme is that our spiritual ancestors were empowered with the Holy Spirit, and we still have the ability to be empowered with the Holy Spirit as well. We still have that same power that the Holy Spirit can give us. Um, and God has sent the Holy Spirit to help us to be witnesses, witnesses to all the parts of the world, uh, all the parts of the earth. So that's going to be an awesome opportunity as we grow and mature ourselves. The when, the dating of the book of Acts is really not conclusive. And I mentioned last week, I went through a, a couple reasons on how we came up with a range, but the range of the writing of the book of Acts is anywhere from between AD 60 in AD 64. So kind of a four or five year window uh, that we see that it's probably possible that this book of Acts was written in. The where. Well, we start off in Jerusalem and the book of Acts ends in Rome. So a first life lesson right off the bat. If you are liking to write down life lessons, you can. Otherwise, I believe they're going to be showing up on the screen. The book of Acts furnishes us with the information on who shared and how the gospel was shared with individuals that we see in the New Testament letters. So the book of Acts furnishes us with the information on who shared and how the gospel was shared with individuals that we see in the New Testament letters. So that's going to be something that we won't see all of that in chapter 1, but as we go through the 28 chapters of Acts, we're going to see all the different players that make this early church come to life and how it started in Jerusalem and spread throughout the world. So Acts chapter 1, let's go ahead and read now just as an overview of the verses that we're going to cover tonight. So I'm going to backtrack just one verse to verse 8 and then go through to the end of the chapter. Verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Those were Jesus' last words. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by, stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath's day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, <coughs> Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Verse 15. And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Akil Dama, that is, field of blood. 
for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. And another Psalm, let another take his office. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So that's the end of Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit was promised, and he came to the apostles, as we'll study uh, beginning in Acts chapter 2. There's a quote that I'd like to start off with. A.W. Tozer said, If the Holy Spirit were taken away from the New Testament church as seen in the book of Acts, then 90% of what was happening then would cease. If the Holy Spirit were taken away from the church today, 10% of what is happening would cease. So you can kind of see that's kind of a condemnation, I guess, of the status or the state of the church now compared to when uh, the early church was thought of. Uh, the Holy Spirit played such an important role in the early church that 90% of what they were doing would come to cease. Whereas nowadays, A.W. Tozer wrote several years ago that he was speculating that only 10% of the works going on would cease. Whether that's accurate or not, it's just kind of his perception of what he sees the role of the Holy Spirit in the present day church. So verse 8 let me reread it just so it's fresh in our mind. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. This verse made it very clear that every believer is commissioned and commanded to share the gospel with the lost world that we live in today. We are his ambassadors in this world. Another uh, passage in scripture where we can see this word ambassador show up is in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 where it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So none of them had seen an, an ascension, you know, Jesus rising up into the sky, let alone Jesus anyone else. They had never seen this before. So this was something brand new for all of them, uh, something that they will never forget, I'm sure. They probably never forgot this to the day they died. This was a supernatural event because we see here earth, gravity, releasing Jesus, and he just levitated in front of them from the mount they call Olivet upward into a cloud. They just see Jesus elevating and going up into the sky. So just think of the questions that the apostles must have had as they're witnessing Jesus going up into the sky, being encompassed by this cloud. Um, they probably started asking. Certainly Peter must have been mumbling and asking himself, and maybe even asking out loud, Jesus, you didn't give us a five- or a ten-year plan. You know, what are we supposed to do? Um, do we use pews or do we use folding tables? Do we use uh, round or rectangular tables? Uh, what about the dress codes? What are we supposed to say about that? What about the offering envelopes? Do we post people's giving on the internet, on the web? Um, explain this Trinity thing to us once again. I mean, they probably just had question after question after question. Uh, I mean, as Jesus was going up, he said his last words in verse 8, and now he's, he's gone physically uh, away from the earth. So they just had, I'm sure, a lot of questions, as you and I would, I'm sure, as well. So can imagine what happened in heaven when Jesus ascended. As soon as he left the earth, our earthly vision, our presence, he was there in heaven. Uh, I'm sure at that point the Old Testament saints had assurance that they too will one day be raised, as the scripture says. So Jesus disappears from the earthly vision and appears immediately before his father's throne with a human body now. 
the only man-made thing, you've probably heard Pastor David say this before and maybe uh, other uh, pastor preachers that you may have listened to, but the only man-made thing in heaven will now be the marks on Jesus' body. Uh, that's kind of interesting to think about, that man put marks on Jesus' body, and those will be evident and able to see in heaven someday by us. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. So his marks, his vision is going to be recognizable, but yet also evidence of his scourging, his passion that he went through. This cloud that it mentions where Jesus was raised up into, was this just, can you imagine, is this possibly the same cloud that guided Israel around the wilderness for 40 years? Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm reading through the Bible right now, and I'm in the book of Numbers, um, and it's talking about, you know, as they're camping in the wilderness and moving from one destination to another, so they had the cloud by day and the, the pillar of fire by night. So is, could it be the same cloud? Or could it be the same cloud that stood over the tabernacle? Um, just something interesting to think about, questions that we, I'm sure we can ask when we get to heaven someday. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Um, ba -ba. Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. It says men of Galilee. Why did the, these two men say men of Galilee? Well, there's no specific reason except that he was just calling them out as they were. They were simple men from Galilee. You know, they were not uh, trained religious leaders uh, by any means. It says in other passages of Scripture they were just regular fishermen, men from Galilee. Uh, so that's something that God delights in, that he was able to use these, for lack of a better term, simple men from Galilee for a mighty work. And they're going to go on and do great miraculous things as we read more in the book of Acts and in other parts of Scripture. Then also they say this same Jesus. This same Jesus is referring to Jesus' second coming. He, the same Jesus, will return someday. And that's also promised in Scripture. So as Jesus went up, he's going to return and come back down. So it wasn't Newton that said what goes up must come down. That fact was established here in Acts. So what goes up must come down was established here in Acts. So then it also says in like manner. So what is referred to by in like manner? It says, well, it was Jesus. He was taken up in a cloud, and it says in Scripture he's going to return in a cloud. He was taken up physically and he will one day return physically. And thirdly, he was taken up publicly, and he's going to return publicly. So in all those three ways, in like manner, as he left, he's going to return in a cloud, physically, and publicly. So I thought that was uh, interesting. Just these little phrases, they all kind of do mean something. Verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount, mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. So the Mount of Olives, um, I've actually been privileged enough to go to Israel and to be there, and I've actually walked on the Temple Mount, I've walked around Jerusalem, I've been on the, the Mount of Olives. Um, so I've been there, and I didn't measure anything, but I read from other sources that the Mount of Olives is about 400 feet higher than the Kidron Valley. So we have Jerusalem, and then down some steep hills, walking paths actually, to get down there. And that's how Jesus and the disciples and apostles got back and forth between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. So the Mount of Olives is 400 feet higher than the Kidron Valley. And then from the Kidron Valley up to Jerusalem is another 200 feet. So the Mount of Olives is up here at 400. This is actually around elevation 200. I don't know if it's actually sea level, but I'm just using those numbers in reference. So the Mount of Olives, you're 200 feet higher than the city of Jerusalem, so you're able to look down on the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet. Mount Olivet. And that was actually Jesus' Jesus's first vision or view of Jerusalem. We read in other passages of Scripture. 
actually on the Mount of Olives, there are three churches uh, presently there. And they all claim that one, their, each of their churches has the, the spot where Jesus is lifted off and ascended to heaven. Um, but it's kind of interesting that I guess those folks that built those churches actually never read, read the book of Luke, because in Luke 24, verse 50 and 51, it says, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Bethany was on the other side of this mountain. It's not really a mountain like we think of a rocky mountain. It was just a big hill um, for the, the land around there typically was somewhat flat. But Bethany was on the other side or a little bit away from the top of this Mount of Olives. So all of those three churches, they couldn't have been the spot where Jesus ascended to heaven. It was over near or in Bethany, as Scripture tells us. So a Sabbath day journey is also mentioned in this passage of Scripture. What is a Sabbath day's journey? Well, it's about 2,000 cubits by Jewish law, which is about 2,000 paces, which is about a half a mile. So you can kind of get the feeling that you're able to walk around a half a mile away from your homestead uh, on a Sabbath. So what is a Sabbath, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Jewish Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown is what they consider their Sabbath. Um, by a lot of Christians, though, they would consider their Sabbath a Sunday. So a Sabbath day journey is about a half mile walk, uh, but I think it was just even this past Sunday, um, I think it was Pastor David shared, you know, that uh, sometimes they got around that by tying ropes and strings to their house that could extend their walk past a, a Jewish customary Sabbath day walk. So that, Friday sundown to what? Saturday sundown. So 24 hours, essentially, just from Friday night to Saturday night. So verse 13. <clears throat> And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Alphaeus, Simon, and Judas, the son of James. So the traditional site of this upper room can still be visited today. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I've been to Jerusalem. I've been in this traditional site of the upper room, and it will actually fit 120 people in it. Uh, I was listening again to um, uh, Pastor Skip Heitzig, um, who's a, a pastor out in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, but anyhow, he, took, he takes groups over to Israel and gives tours, and one of his tours actually had slightly over 120 people in it, and they were all able to fit into this upper room area. Um, so it's very feasible that the room that's still present there today, the traditional site, may actually be the physical room uh, uh, where it's speaking of here. Also, the same upper room that's mentioned in Scripture uh, is likely the room Jesus spent the last Passover in with his disciples. So there are 11 apostles uh, present in the upper room. Judas Iscariot is dead at this point, and they're about to address that in an upcoming passage of Scripture that we're going to read here shortly. Verse 14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Notice they were all in one accord. The last time they were in the same upper room, they were arguing about which of them was the greatest. So being in one accord means they were all in agreement. They were all getting along for once, and they weren't arguing with one another. And then they were in prayer and in supplication with one another. So why were they kind of all in one accord now? Well, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus has just happened. I mean, they've just been made witness of miraculous things. And they've also just got done spending 40 days uh, with Jesus alive after his resurrection and the word being opened and revealed to them. So they are just mighty men of God right now. And they've just kind of been able to put aside any of their petty differences and arguments that they had going on before. And now they understand their true mission that they're being about ready to be sent out on. Notice Jesus' brothers were there too. Uh, he had sisters also. If you wanted to read a little bit more on that, you could go to Mark chapter 6, verse 3. 
Mark 6, verse 3, where it mentions Jesus' brothers. Uh, nowhere in Scripture are we given Jesus' sisters' names, uh, but his four brothers' names are James, Jude, or Judas, uh, Simon, and then, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this very well, Joses or Joseph. Um, so basically, James, Jude, Simon, and Joseph are his four brothers' names. Um, Mary is mentioned also here in this passage, and it, this is actually the last time that you'll see her mentioned in Scripture. Nowhere going to the right in your Bible, towards the end of the Bible, will you see Mary's name show up anymore in Scripture. This is the last time. And notice that they are praying with Mary, not praying to Mary. She was there engaged in prayer with them, and they weren't praying to her. So I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail of um, how the Catholic Church kind of prays to Mary and venerates her. Um, that's, a, that's a whole different topic someday. But there, Mary is there praying with these men of God. So verse 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of names was about 120, and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested him. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. So verse 15, Peter stood up because at this point now he's been restored and somewhat recognized now as a leader. Peter often stood up and said things in Scripture that we've read about in times past or in Scripture's past, especially in the disciples. Uh, things we knew should be said, Peter said them. Things we knew that really shouldn't be said, Peter said them. Things we weren't quite sure if they should be said, Peter said them. So you've probably heard of that phrase, you know, foot and mouth disease. Uh, on occasion, Peter been, has been claimed to have that foot and mouth disease, meaning he, at usually the most inopportune time, he would say things and sometimes wish that he hadn't have said them. Uh, but he wasn't afraid to speak his mind, and that's what a lot of people love about Peter. I know I do. 120 people. Well, you might think, well, that seems kind of a, like a low number. Uh, one might expect uh, a lot more people to be rallying around this group now and, and gathered together in this upper room. Likely, many of these people were those that also saw the risen Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So fallen asleep here just means that they have physically passed on, um, so they, they've died, uh, but there's still many of them still remain to the present. Um, so where are these other 300 and some people, um, don't know, but at least 120 of them were convinced and convicted enough to kind of show up and record it in Scripture. Verse 16 and 17 I've read already, and it says here, Peter spoke boldly and with authority and with knowledge. Now, more than we've ever seen or, or more than we've ever read Peter uh, being spoken of before. So uh, the next life lesson God used human authors to write the Bible and other individuals to accomplish so much because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. God used human authors to write the Bible and other individuals to accomplish so much because they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we just got done reading uh, how uh, Peter has now been inspired and much information has been revealed to him uh, through the scriptures pertaining to what David said in the book of Psalms. In this particular passage, uh, verse 20, that first passage in your Bible, if you're wondering, if you don't have a, um, a study Bible per se, uh, it is actually Psalm 69, verse 25, where it says, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it. That's Psalm 69, 25. And then the second passage, it says, Let another take his office. That's Psalm 109, verse 8. So those are passages of Scripture from the Old Testament that David wrote that Peter now is bringing to, from his memory, bringing out and using in communications here. De Peter has been now inspired by God to share this information. 
Verse, or Psalm 41, verse 9 reads, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trust, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Uh, a reference here, again, if you have a study Bible, they may, it may show parallel passages in your Bible. So for this verse um, 16, it references this Psalm 41, verse 9. So I went back to Psalm 41, verse 9 in my study Bible here, and I reread it. And I actually noticed that I had written in my Bible, which is okay to do, and I had written in there that I thought this verse at one point years ago was referring to Ahithophel. Ahithophel was a trusted advisor of David when David was king and ruling Jerusalem. But it turns out that Peter tells us now, through being inspired by the Holy Spirit, that who David was really referring to was not Ahithophel, but he was referring to Judas. So I had to go back in my Bible, and where I thought it said was referring to Ahithophel, I crossed it out. And then I wrote in there, see Acts 1, verse 16, because this is who David is talking about. It's Judas, not Ahithophel. So to me, that's a good thing. I was able to uh, correct something that I thought I was wrong in a particular situation in Scripture, and that's what I meant by being a Berean, studying Scriptures thoroughly enough to know what they, they mean. Usually, um, everything in the Bible is, you probably heard Pastor David say too, that the Bible was written in, in language simple enough for most 8th graders, maybe even a 6th grader, to read. Um, so it's not real complex language, um, but sometimes the concepts are deeper than some of us can grasp, especially at the first pass of reading, so we have to reread them or sometimes come back to them uh, over the course of years of rereading our Bible and uh, also by paying attention in our studies through Pastor David teaching and so on. Um, that's where we can learn uh, from week to week. Verse 18 and verse 19, which I've already read, it mentions this field. Uh, this field of blood was bought using the 30 pieces of silver that Judas was given. And why was Judas given these 30 pieces of silver? To betray Jesus. That paltry amount of money is what he had asked for to betray Jesus. And then it goes on to talk about, you know, the, the, how uh, Judas, his middle burst open and his entrails spilled out. Uh, Peter was kind of a, a country boy, and he shared information often with little discretion. Uh, so he liked to stick just to the facts, nothing more, nothing less, no matter how gruesome they might be. So he didn't try to couch or soften his words. He just said the, the guy's entrails gushed out. Um, you know, nowadays we might offend quite a, bit, quite a few people by, by saying that, but Peter wasn't worried about that. And some of you may be thinking, well, I, th I thought I remember Judas died by hanging himself. And I would say, well, you're right. He did. Um, so here's how the story goes. Um, if we put together a couple passages of scripture, we can guide, kind of get the full story. So when Judas recognizes what he's done, he feels terribly remorseful, and he goes out and he gets a rope. He goes and finds a tree. Remember I was talking about Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley, and then the Mount of Olives. There's some pretty steep, hilly areas there where there's actually some steep uh, embankments and cliffs uh, nearby. So he, he probably found a tree on the edge of one of these steep hills, he took that rope, he tied it, he had to climb up into the tree most likely, tied that rope to a branch, tied the other end of the rope around his neck, and at some point in time, he jumped off that branch, and what either happened was the branch broke, and he fell and plummeted, plummeted down into this ravine, tumbling, and his guts spilled out. Or maybe it was the earthquake that took place, and uprooted that tree. It fell down. He tumbled it in the ravine and <clears throat> burst open. So there's possible different ways that um, um, Judas could have died at this point in time. So, are you, so you're saying that maybe it wasn't his actual act of hanging from a tree? Just what happened was, afterwards. It was a natural yeah. A, a byproduct of hanging himself, of trying to hang himself, something happened where, because normally we've seen all the Western movies, you know, where people hang themselves and it has nothing to do with the lower part of their body. It's usually just their neck snapping, and that's what kills them. But most likely, one of these old olive trees or whatever type of tree it might have been, the branch broke, 
he fell down and tumbled into this ravine, and uh, that's what caused the rest of his bodily damage to occur. So, again, no discrepancy in the Bible. That's kind of what I was trying to point, point out there, as by putting passages of Scripture together, if you want to go to Matthew 27, verses 3 through 8, that talks about Judas um, going out and hanging himself. And then here in Acts 18, um, Acts 1, verse 18, we get kind of the rest of the story. So by pa uh, pairing these two verses together, we get the full account of Scripture. Uh, and that's a good thing. A lot of times in some passages of Scripture, you won't get the whole story. So you kind of have to read two or three other passages of Scripture to get the whole story. And that's what we see here in the story of Judas hanging himself and how uh, his entrails end up gushing out. So verse 20, um, we move down to um, these passages in Scripture that Peter refers to. These are from Psalms. The book of Psalms referred to are Psalm 69, verse 25, and Psalm 109, verse 8. And then also we can understand from what uh, Peter is saying here to the group of 120 people that essentially Judas had defected from the group of apostles. Uh, he had denied the faith, and this was the reason Peter asked that Judas be replaced. Actually, not that Judas was now dead, but just the fact that he had defected from the group of apostles and betrayed Jesus. So it says also here, let another take his office. Let another take his office. Peter is saying that Judas's spot was needing to be replaced. There does need to still be a 12th apostle. So with Judas now out of the picture, they're left with 11. So they need that 12th apostle. Again, maybe through revelation of the Holy Spirit speaking to him, they said, hey, we need to elect another person into this apostleship so that we, way we can go forward with 12 apostles still for the time being. So this word another in this passage is in the Greek, it's called heteros, which is a speaking of the quality of a person. So heteros is speaking of the quality of a person and means one not of the same nature. So Peter was saying, we don't want another person like Judas. We want someone totally different than what Judas was. That's what he's re really referring to, meaning we need to get a believer into this spot. So yes, I'm saying Judas was not saved. He was not a believer in Jesus. So I'm going to go on and, and share a couple passages here because um, I know this may be one of two things that I bring up tonight that uh, there's probably been maybe not controversy, but just uh, different ideas about Judas and about the apostles I'll bring up a little bit later. But even Jesus himself said in John chapter 6, verse 70, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil? He was referring to Judas at that point. He didn't come out and say, hey, Judas, you're the devil at that point, but that's who he was referring to. And then in John 13, verses 26 and 27, we read, and having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do it quickly. So we know from the full counsel of Scripture, reading throughout the rest of the Bible, that we know that a believer cannot be indwelt by a demon uh, or by Satan. But yet we see here Scripture telling us that Satan entered Judas. Judas is not a believer. Matthew 27, verse 3, says Judas was only remorseful. Some people say, well, maybe at the very end, right before he hung himself, he accepted Jesus. But again, back to that Matthew 27, verse 3 through 8 passages I referred to, you can look at the words there, and it says Judas was only remorseful. Not that he repented and chose then to believe in Jesus. He didn't do that. Let me say this again. Elvis is not alive. And Judas was not a believer. <laughs> All right. Verse 21 and 22. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from one, us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. 
So what might be the criteria for be becoming the next apostle? They're about ready to elect a new apostle. So what has the criteria got to be? What is this person's mis mission statement? Uh, what does it need to look like? Well, it, it says here, a before and after witness of Jesus. Basically, a, a contemporary with Jesus before his death and before his burial. And then also, they must have been a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they had to be alive and around and witness what Jesus did before his death and burial and also witness Jesus after his resurrection. That was necessary, they thought, to be called an apostle. Here's the second um, point that may cause uh, some people to scratch their heads that I'm going to bring up, besides Judas not being a, a believer, was that it's possible possible, because I'm going to clarify at the very end of my discussion here, that Paul was never meant to be the 12th apostle, okay? A lot of people think for sure it had to be Paul, right? Most likely, it's hard to say. I'm going to read some scriptures here on why it's possible that he wasn't meant to be the 12th apostle. So in the strict sense of the word, was Paul to be considered the 12th apostle? Uh, probably, maybe not. Uh, mainly because Paul hadn't even met Jesus yet. God kept Paul purposely apart also so his ministry could be to the Gentiles. Paul did not accompany the apostles with Jesus. So that doesn't even fit one of the criteria that Peter mentions needs to be one of the criteria. Paul hadn't seen and heard what the other apostles had. Paul didn't see the risen Christ in bodily form. Paul had no earthly contact with Jesus or his teachings while Jesus was alive. Paul did not include himself with the other apostles. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Um, after that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Uh, Paul does not include himself there. Scripture declares who the twelve are even before Paul was saved. So I'm going to read two scripture passages, one in Acts 2, then Acts 6, and Paul doesn't get saved until Acts 9. So in these passages of scripture, they are in chronological order, the best I can tell. So Paul isn't even saved when the 12 apostles are named in scripture. So Acts 2 verse 14 says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, so Peter, standing with the eleven, makes twelve. Acts 6, verse 2 says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, So right there it says, there's the twelve apostles. That was in Acts 6. So Paul doesn't get saved until his Damascus Road experience, which was in Acts chapter 9. So are there still apostles today? Well, I would kind of answer that question by saying yes and no. So what do I mean by that? Well, positionally, or in the strict sense of the word, I would say no, there, there's not any more apostles. Um, because there will never be another original 12 apostles that met the criteria that Peter called out here as far as being alive and witnessing Jesus before his death and burial and witnessing Jesus after his resurrection. Those guys are dead. Um, so there's no more of those 12 apostles. So positionally, those apostles are no longer around. But in a functional sense, so could someone still function as an apostle nowadays or even after these 12 apostles had passed on? And I would say yes to that because Scripture supports that. That's why I would say this. So in Acts 14, verse 14, which we'll get to a few months from now, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude. So Barnabas and Paul are called apostles here. Romans 6, verse 7, it says, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So two more apostles mentioned here. Galatians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So now Paul here is claiming to be apostle, but not one of the positional 12, 
merely just what I would call a functional apostle at this point. Galatians 1, 18 and 19. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So now we see another apostle being named James. This is the fleshly brother of Jesus that was not even a believer until after the resurrection of Jesus. But now here he's called an apostle. So Paul was the functional apostle to the Gentiles, but possibly not one of the 12 positional apostles. Verse 22. Let's see where it starts. Beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. One of these must. So that phrase there, what does that mean? There was unity among the 11, at least, and they all agreed that either of these two guys was a good or the right choice. They're about to mention the two names. They're about ready to propose two names to God to vote on. Um, so they all thought that of these two, they met the criteria that Peter laid out there in verse uh, 21 to be apostle material. Matthew 19, verse 28 says, So Jesus said to them, Assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So these twelve positional apostles, they're actually going to have their names written on a foundation stone in the new heaven. Uh, which we won't read about that until Revelation, way down the road. So we have 12 apostles, and I'm going to make a comment about that uh, when we get to my last points here. Verse 23 and 24. And they proposed two. So they're proposing two names now. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. <laughs> so, you know, a bystander, some person listening to this, uh, you know, not in authority or a position of leadership, but listening to what's going on uh, with the, the apostles talking and getting ready to vote, um, I could see myself almost chuckling if I was listening in through a window you know, they're, they're proposing and throwing out to God, here, God, here's our two choices. It's only these two. It's only these possible two guys. You pick which one you think is going to be the next apostle. So why do I think that's funny? Well, we probably should not limit God in your prayers with our choices. So, but why? Why would you say that? Well, both of your choices might be wrong, <laughs> right? We're not, we're not perfect, and what if both of our choices are too limiting? Uh, what if God has something bigger and better for us than what your two choices allow? Well, that's kind of what they're doing here a little bit, but they're kind of going by what they know and through the revelation that has been revealed to Peter. So these two names, uh, they're a good or a right choice. Verses 25 and 26. To take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So he makes number twelve. So casting of lots isn't used or repeated anymore after Pentecost that we're going to read here in Acts chapter 2. So after the Holy Spirit uh, came upon the church, the believers didn't have to cast lots to determine the will of God anymore. Um, why? Because the Holy Spirit now directs them after Pentecost takes place. So no more casting of the lots. You read, it, you read about that if, um, often in the Old Testament. Um, sometimes they were using the, the Urim and the Thummim um, that comes up in Scripture. And there were casting of lots, uh, but no more after Acts 2 will we read of the casting of lots taking place anymore. Many have argued about whether Matthias was the right choice as the 12th apostle. 
Have you considered why? Well, nowhere before Scripture and nowhere after Scripture, actually nowhere after verse 23 in Acts chapter 1, do you see Matthias' name show up, before or after. So that's kind of unique or interesting, isn't it, that Matthias' name doesn't show up in Scripture, but evidently he was well-known. I mean, he and this justice individual were, they fit the criteria of being an apostle. And they obviously they were men of good standing and they thought they were the good or the right choice. So even though scripture doesn't record who Matthias is, we just don't know much about the guy. So that'll be one guy we might want to talk to in heaven and say, hey, what, what's your story? Uh, what do you do? Um, what part did you play in, uh, and so forth? So since they had already voted, notice they've already cast their lots and voted before the Spirit had come upon them. The lots fell to Matthias before the Holy Spirit had come upon them. We won't know for sure until we get to heaven if Matthias or Paul's name is on the 12th foundation stone of this new heaven as one of the positional 12. I guess we just won't know. Um, it, it doesn't really come out and say definitively who that 12th apostle. Is it truly Matthias? Some would argue yes. Should it have been Paul? Because if they had waited for the Holy Spirit to come first and then they voted, would it have been different? Would it have been Paul revealed as should have been that 12th apostle? Maybe, maybe not. Isn't it great that sometimes we just aren't given all the answers? Our God is just not that small or simple that we can comprehend him completely. His thoughts are certainly greater than our thoughts. So we began this chapter with Jesus speaking to the apostles and ascending to heaven with kind of what sounds like a, a shrouded and mysterious message to them as he disappears up into the clouds. They must have been bewildered, but they did regroup finally in the upper room under the leadership of Peter. And if we call ourselves a believer, a follower of Christ, or a God follower, follower uh, whatever phrase you like to use, then we now know that Jesus is our ultimate leader now. So turning to Jesus now, if we haven't already, is and can be a very simple thing to do. First, we just need to admit that we've made mistakes, that we've missed the mark, and that we've sinned. Then we need to repent of any wrongdoings that we might have done. We need to ask for forgiveness. And we need to turn away from the things that Jesus calls sins. And by faith, we need, then need to put our faith and our trust in Jesus. So for anyone wanting to make that confession of faith for the first time or maybe just making a rededication of their faith in Jesus, please bow your head now and repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me to forgive me of my sins. I believe you were resurrected that I may have new life. Help me to turn from the things you call sin and turn to you always. Please give me the power to live for you all the days of my life. Give me a hunger for you and your word. And I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this study in your word and going through the book, chapter of Acts 1. Lord, we just pray that if anybody really made that true confession of faith just now, Lord, that they would ask any questions that they might have afterward or that they would continue on their walk of getting to know you closer and more intimately. And Lord, just continue to draw them closer to you. So we just thank you again for this opportunity, for this study. And Lord, I pray that there was um, some, a nugget of information in there, Lord, that people will spur them on to, to be digging into your word and learn more for themselves and to be a Berean, a studier of your word. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.